What would a global democratic society look like? I mean, people talk about democracy a lot, but I've actually seen very little, I found very little interesting material on what is, what would democracy really be? I mean, the thing we have is not democracy at all. Um, the fact, the fact that, you know, you can vote every four years or whatever, I mean, that is a way to get information. That's how people share our first album, is by putting an X on a piece of paper. I mean, there's no information flow. I mean, it, it couldn't work. Um, the point is, is that you don't, you don't know what people's, you can't say, you can't represent the will of the people if there is no will. Where, where does the will of the people ever find a place to express itself? Or where does it even have a place to come into existence? I mean, a bunch of people sort of each thinking themselves, or maybe a couple little discussions. I mean, you don't even get to develop your thinking about what you would want society to be like. There has to be a forum for that to happen in. Um, so, I, you know, I'll present you with a model of how a global democratic society might work. And this is, it's not, this isn't something I invented. It's like, it's a matter of um, studying what has been tried and what hasn't been tried and what's worked on small scales and then sort of, it's sort of uh, it would have to be this way if it was going to be a democratic society uh, from a systems point of view. Um, so the, the starting point is what I call localization and harmonization. Localization simply means uh, moving sovereignty down to the local unit, community size, neighborhood size. It's the basic sovereign unit of society. And harmonization is about the way in which decisions are made in, in a community. So I just call that a community. Although it might be a neighborhood or who knows what geographically. So harmonization simply means that um, you start off with everybody having their own competing ideas or competing interests. Um, we should do things this way, we should do things that way. And through a process of dialogue, um, you get past that point of, okay, here's a room full of people, each of which has a position, okay? That's kind of the starting point. And the positions are debating. And if you stick with it long enough and with the right kind of facilitation in dialogue, you can, you can get to another level where you see, well, what we really have is different people here, who are each real people. And, eat, you know, they both, you have grandchildren, I have grandchildren, you know, we have more in common than we do. You get beyond the positions, you get to say, there are real people here. And they each have concerns. Like, I'm concerned about this is going to happen, or I'm concerned there's going to be too much crime, or, you know, whatever, there's going to be too many police. And each have your concerns. And you get into the space of, we all have a common problem to solve. And that common problem is, how do we, what... Solutions do we want to pursue? What directions do we want to go that take everyone's concerns into account? So rather than, I want to see my concerns achieved at the sacrifice of your concerns, it's more uh, on a collaborative basis, how can we come up with creative answers that work for everybody? So th there's really a shift in focus in this dialogue, in a, one of these dialogue processes, you know, where you go from issues to people. And once it's people trying to solve problems together, then an immense amount of energy gets released. Because all, all that energy that was used to defend positions and to argue and to win, that gets, it, it's almost, you know, it almost brings tears to your eyes when you, when you feel it. It's like uh, you're suddenly liberated to just be open and, and be honest about what it is you need and to listen to what other people need. And... Um, it's not a matter of decision making, it's a matter of creative problem solving. It's really about problem solving. It's really how do we deal with schools or with parking or with traffic or whatever it is um, that is going to benefit all of us. And it turns out that um, when people get off their positions, then uh, there's room for sy synergy is opened up. You can suddenly use part of this idea and part of that idea. And you suddenly find that you're working together than working against each other. Now, this kind of process, this what I call harmonization process, in a small, let's say a group this size, um, maybe even a few more, you, a group this size, if we were to 
spend like four days together, you know, um, you know, big morning session, big afternoon session, the lunch break, that kind of thing. Stick with it for like four days with the facilitator. Um, it's guaranteed, you know, like a group of people from a, when you get at the other end, no matter how divergent the views were at the beginning, no matter how much people had opposite ways of looking at things, at the end of those four days, it's, it's like guaranteed that they would have gone through an experience, almost, you know, almost a hugging kind of experience where they um, had a breakthrough of mutual understanding and a breakthrough of new ideas and came up with uh, solutions that were better than any of them were hoping for. It's like, well, I wanted this, but what we got was even better. That's, that's the kind of experience that really does happen. Uh, there's a whole industry of facilitation. It, it, they count people that work with teams and companies, try to improve effectiveness of teams. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a proven technology. Um, it just hasn't been applied as much as it should be applied to society and communities. It's more done in business, or maybe activist groups would, would get into it, you know, when they're trying to organize something. Um, there's, a, there's a fellow in Port Townsend, Washington, named Jim Ruff, and he, um, he was actually working in a sawmill up in Arcata uh, some years ago. And um, he was brought in as a consultant to improve employee-employer relations, whatever. He was getting no support from management, so all he could do was just work with the workers, who had very little motivation about anything there. Um, but over a period of a couple of years or so, working with them, he developed this dialogue process with them. And they like doubled the productivity of the factory and cleaned it up and got rid of all the sawdust in the air and you know all these creative things um, just to make their own life better in the in the company. And out of that experience, he refined that into something he calls dynamic facilitation. Now it's one kind of facilitation. It happens to be you know I think a pretty advanced one, but there's other ones and there's lots of different facilitators who different have different personal styles and it's, it's partly a matter of. Uh, just having the native empathy to be a facilitator. And so he has this process, dynamic facilitation, and then he packages it with something he calls a wisdom council. And um, he, tr he did one of these up in uh, Ashland, and they called it the Rogue Valley Wisdom Council. And um, I want to tell you about that because it's an example of how a dialogue process can be used in a community. It's not that I'm completely trying to sell you on Jim's Wisdom Council program, which has a whole political overtones to it, which I don't necessarily go along with. But in terms of having a dialogue process in a community, it was very powerful. So what they did is they selected randomly a small group of people. It wasn't that many. It was only like eight or so. And um, they were just ordinary people. They weren't activists. They weren't people. They weren't political organizers in their community or anything like that. And uh, at the beginning, they said, well, what are you here for? I says, well, I don't know. This sounds sort of interesting. I wonder what's going to happen. You know? So they just came along, stuck with it for a few days with Jim Ruff facilitating. And at the end of the time, they were like really energized. It's like they'd gone through one of these empowerment trainings or something. You know? But all what they'd gone through was just a dialogue process. And where the energy came from was this realization that us ordinary people who aren't anybody special and don't have any great ideas were able to actually work together creatively and come up with some very interesting ideas. And so they were like different people in front of the, up at the panel table with their microphones, you know, reporting to the, what they, what part of Jim's formula for the Wisdom Council is to have a public meeting, just invite anybody in who wants to come. And then the people that were in the actual dialogue process to report on what happened. So. The people who were doing the reporting were just really excited. And they had come up with this, they'd come up spontaneously with the phrase, we the people. Like, out of that experience of finding what ordinary people were capable of doing and agreeing on and stuff, they said, wow, you know, we, there could really be something more like a real democracy. We the people should have more say. You know, that's the feeling they came up with. And the, all the people in the room in the public meeting responded to that. So the whole meeting, and then they broke up into little tables and had discussions, you know. And the whole meeting was energized. Like everybody was thinking, wow, this should, something should happen. But there was no follow-on. You know, they, they tried a wisdom council, and it was successful and energizing, but they didn't really have any follow-on to that. So the, um, 
my hypothesis or my vision for what could happen is if you had these kind of dialogue processes on an ongoing basis in a community over a period of months, that it would be these, the public meetings that happened afterwards would tend to get larger. People would bring their neighbors next time, you know, and, and there would tend to be an awareness in the community of this, these dialogue processes. It would be like an opportunity for the community to dialogue with itself, kind of on a, a jury basis, you know. It's like one of these little dialogue, <clears throat> sort of like a grand jury. It's like representatives of the community dealing with issues. Um, and the fact that if, see, if it's a random group, if it, if it includes people from both sides of the track, so to speak, and, um, and youth as well as older people and all that, you know, in the same, the fact, if they come up with something that they all buy into, then you can see how it's likely that it would make sense to people in the community generally, because uh, in, in a general sense, nobody's been left out. So like in the first one, maybe they'd identify a couple issues and have a few ideas, and, and then maybe in the second one, they'd have that to build on, you know, the people in the second dialogue process would have known about the first one and they tend to build on it. So I could see con over a period of months it would converge toward a general community sense of, well, these are what we see as the big issues in our community and these are the kind of things we would like to see done. You know? And um, as people got used to this kind of process, you could see where it would be possible to have mo something bigger, mo more like a town meeting, you know, maybe with breakout sessions. Now, as a matter of fact, this is kind of how government works in Cuba. In Cuba, they have, um, I forget the, the Spanish name for it, but they have uh, small groupings of about 1,500 or so that would get together every, whatever the number of years is, that they have elections, and they would basically have a, a dialogue session. I don't know what processes they use. Um, and they have pretty high turnout. I think it's something like 85% or so come to these things. And they discuss not just their local issues, but they discuss the problems of Cuba, you know, and look at what's their input to that. And then they select, it's not like voting, it's not like there's a competition for representatives, but they then select a slate of candidates who are people that have ordinary jobs, they're not politicians. And these people would be like excused from work to go off to the parliament or whatever they call it, you know, for their sessions. So Cuba actually has the closest thing that I've seen to a democratic structured government. Um, and it, it starts with, with the uh, community uh, dialogue process, coming out what do people really want to have happen. Now, the, the, so I was talking, that, that's how, all of that was about harmonization. So remember, the, the principles of what I would consider to be a democratic society starts with localization and harmonization. So you start with communities. Um, where in, internal to that is completely democratic. Everybody participates. Everybody's voice is heard. Everybody kind of, you know, knows each other, more or less. It's small enough for that to have face-to-face -face knowledge of each other. Now, a larger scale than that, you really can't have a democratic, direct democratic process. It just isn't possible. It's too many people. So once you have democracy in every community all around the world, <clears throat> Then um, communities would simply, like if two different communities both had a d dispute about how to use the river that went between them, then obviously they would just each get a delegation to meet and harmonize their interests. So it's like a fractal process. You know, what works among people in a community works among communities in a region and works among regions in a province and works among provinces. I mean, the whole idea of nation nations would be less, they might be like a cultural identity, but they wouldn't really be political entities. I mean, there, there, there's no need for any government in any level. See, in, in the community, you don't need a government. Everybody participates and decides what the policy should be. You need agencies. You need somebody to fix roads and somebody to man Coast Guard ships and all that. But um, you don't need to delegate decision making to anybody in the community level. And then once you have, see then, if communities need to work something out, say on a regional scale, well, they all send a delegation, there's a council a conference, and it might go on, for, it's worth, it can go on for a few days, or a few weeks even, whatever's necessary. Solve the problems, and then go back home. There's no state building sitting there, <laughs> taking up tax money. There's no need to have any government at any level. 